the average recreational golfer coming here and they don't really have a, a concept or an idea mm -hmm. of how to map up where they should start yeah. the ball online, yeah, right? Yeah. And in our both of our coaching practices, more yeah. often than not, we find that, or for me, whenever I'm running an evaluation through with a player, they generally read it probably only about a third of what it actually is. Absolutely, yeah. I think is half that, is, 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 even at tour level, half is probably the most average. Yeah. Um, there's something with the human eye that sees pretty much 50% of what really needs to be the start line. Mm. Now, I don't know whether it's because people believe that balls stay on the straight apex. line for a long time, yeah. or the apex is part of it, yeah. but I would say um, I've never, I've, I've, I've really can't remember anyone I work with mm. who, would, who, would, who would give a correct read to and they'd say, yeah, that's exactly what I'd aim. Yeah, yeah. I think half is about the average. Okay, okay. So let's say we're starting off step one mm -hmm. for this base level of just teaching a recreational yeah. golfer how to improve their putting. Yeah. What would we look at? There's got to be intentions of matching speed to line. Mm -hmm. So if we say we want to hit it a foot past the hole, mm -hmm. then we need to start it sufficiently high enough to allow for that amount of curve. Correct. If you want it to be four foot past the hole, you're going to aim slightly closer to the hole, but much less chance of it going in because it's going to lip out mm -hmm. or it's going to travel over the top of the hole. Yeah. So realistically, knowing that visually the human eye is that bad at reading putts we have to go straight into aim point mm. we're not looking at high point low point because this green isn't created by glacial erosion <laughs> you know they, yeah, this was yeah, yeah. created by yeah. a machine and they can put slopes wherever they want yeah we hear we hear um things like balls break towards the sea yeah or yeah. they break towards the mountains <laughs> we hear that grain pushes the ball uphill three feet yeah Realistically, the ball follows slope. Yeah. The ball goes downhill. It, it breaks because gravity works upon encourages it. Encourages it. And they can put slopes wherever they want in a green. So one of the, one of the first things you've got to realize is the ball only knows what it rolls across. Correct. So instead of looking for high points and low points, we need to measure what's happening through the putt. So aim point would get you to gauge the, the slopes in a certain place between the ball and the hole. Mm. So. What happens is we can ignore the first third and we can ignore the, the last third. Yeah. And we're only measuring in the, in the middle third, realistically. Okay. That's the area that affects the ball the most. Yeah. Is that due to the speed in which the ball is rolling along it for that we, period of time? Yeah, and it's more to do with, with how much the, the ball's axis is affected by the slopes. Yeah, okay. You know, what we discovered is, is that the biggest slope in the middle third will dictate how much the ball curves, mm. regardless of if it's flatter at the ball or at the hole. Mm. You know, we're not we're not measuring anything outside of those outside of the middle third ever. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, um, building a concept and understanding to, mm. at the beginning is like incredibly important. Mm. Now, extending on from that, uh, let's say that I was setting up to this part and I'm a amateur golfer, right? Yeah. And I'm aiming dead straight, and my first putt generally looks like this. Yeah. And it's gone too far past, mm -hmm. right? And it went on the low side. Exactly, and 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 what you know what was crazy was when we tested kids years and years and years ago, they didn't change their aim. Mm. What they did was they still aimed at the flag, but then started to try and push the ball up the slope more. Mm. So manipulations are what I feel everyone is fighting against in putting. Yeah. For example, you could now aim straight at the cup, and you could open the face at impact. Yeah. And you could make the putt. Yeah. Problem is, you add some stroke length to that for a longer putt, and now that extra loft that that kind of the effect on the ball makes it unmanageable yeah yeah so manipulations would be you adjusting the face to make the putt for example okay and now we're getting into kind of subconscious movements mm. and we call them instincts but realistically your body knows what's coming next so it tries to create something yeah and it's very hit and miss yeah we see that let's say just in the full swing with compensations that players make when the shaft is coming down like a lightning mm. rod and they stand up and putting's the same yeah. thing right exactly if my intention is to get the ball in the hole yeah right but you for whatever reason told me to set up here i would find a way to try and get it back exactly as a huge exaggeration but we do yeah. see that and, and then everyone's trying to have a perfect path and what looks like a perfect action mm. and they have to manipulate to make putts yeah so from my point of view if you if you if you perfect technique before green reading, for example, then you've got to do something wrong to get the ball in the hole. Mm. If you had a putting robot and you gave it a misread, it pretty much wouldn't make any putts. Yeah. And then if you set the face to open, it might make a few putts. If you set the face to close, it might make a few putts. Mm. So that tells us that the, the variables are more successful than the constant yeah. if you can't read a green. 
Yeah. What I find is that uh, people's eyes are drawn to the extremes, like the high point and the low point. Yep. It's like, okay, the earth over there is lower. It must be going over in that yeah. direction. Mm. Rather, and I kind of use this as an analogy, and sure, paraphrasing the situation massively, but back in the day when Tiger used to get down and put his yeah. hands over his eyes, what he's doing, he's narrowing his focus, right? Yes. He's removing the crowds. Exactly. But also, sometimes I encourage players to do this on the putting because it doesn't matter if there's a dead elephant underneath the green <laughs> yeah, over yeah, there. Yeah, exactly. Right? That's not affecting this no. here. I mean, they could, this could be perfectly flat and you could have a, you could have a huge slope next to you. Mm. If the ball doesn't touch the huge slope, it's not going to affect its break. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so break is affected by the tilt that the ball rolls across mm -hmm. and the time it takes to get to the target. Yeah. So tilt creates break. Yeah. Time magnifies it. Mm -hmm. And the things that affect time are speed of green. Mm -hmm. in, our, in our opinion, aim points opinion, a, you know, a, a, a high stimp yeah. or a quick green, yeah. the ball rolls slower but mm -hmm. rolls for longer. So more stimp equals more break only because of the length of time increases. Yeah. Slower greens have to be hit with more velocity. They get there quicker, they break less. Mm -hmm. Uphill putts are the same. Mm -hmm. Downhill putts break more because they roll longer, mm. slower. So then let's say that we're trying to find a way for every golfer out there uh, without taking too much time on the greens because yeah. that's, without a doubt, that's one of the, the common comments that I get. It's like, oh, I don't read a green because I'm worried about <laughs> taking too yeah, long. Yeah. Right. So, Yes, to a degree. If you're going to get down and you're going to do the old Camilo Villegas Spider-Man yeah. and you're going to go on either side, it's going to take a little bit of time, right? Yeah. But you don't need to rub your hand across the whole green and find the bits of grain and figure it out from there, do you? No, I mean, you know, you get 45 seconds from when it's your turn to read a green. Mm -hmm. And I would say my clients have already collected their data before it's their turn. Very good. Um, so, you know, before you even repair your pitch mark, you're going to be feeling the slopes. Yeah. Uh, once, once you've replaced your ball on your coin, yeah. which is now your turn to read the green, you've got your data. It's just a case of putting the fingers up and knowing where to aim. Yeah, correct. you know, um, we we measured all the different styles of green read mm. available, mm. and the only one that's quicker than aim point was the complete guess, <laughs> or the no guess even. Just address yeah. the ball and hit it. But realistically, once you've walked two thirds of the way between you and the hole, yeah. You've read the green yeah. with aim point. Yeah. So it's as quick as it takes to get there. And we, we, we called it express because it's fast. Mm. So there's two reasons we could, I mean, aim point was a booklet, which was the, all the numbers, all the, it looks like four dartboards. Mm -hmm. So the aim point chart was the first product we taught green reading with. And we came up with this idea. We were going to teach kids how to read greens without materials. Yeah. Uh, and the first three clients were PGA Tour players and, and two won. And yeah. one became world's number one. Mm -hmm. So we didn't even have a name for it when Adam Scott won the Honda Classic using this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it was first, it was called Thumbs Up. Yeah. So we came up with a name let, overnight. Let, let, let's be happy that evolved. <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah. And, and, and we called it Express because it's fast. It was yeah. the average read was 10 seconds. Yeah. So you get 45 seconds and the process takes 10. Mm. So there's already a win there. Um, but also the Express was because it's a fast pain relief. You know, yeah. we saw people struggling. We saw yeah. people misreading and, and it's a bit like those painkillers that are yeah. Express relief. Yeah, you correct. Know, if we were going to read this part here, I would just measure here mm -hmm. and there. Mm -hmm. The read's done. Yeah. So I know now how many fingers to use. Mm. And then it's just a case of coming in here. I'm going to come into this position here and I now have my aim point. I yeah. know exactly where I want to start this ball. Yeah. So I don't know how long that took, but it can't be more than 10 seconds. Yeah, and just, just with anything, if you're going to devote the time to working on mm. your full swing, uh, your chipping, your putting, whatever mm. it is, the technique that everyone focuses on, yeah. and we were talk, talking about this earlier, is this can be the best use of your time spent yeah. down at a green, just learning how to go through this process in the correct manner. When people practice putting, so one of the things I always ask people is, is how long do you practice for? Mm. And they'll be like 15, 20 minutes tops. Yeah. Now, I only work in two hour blocks, so I'll work for two hours with someone and they're still fresh. Yeah. Because we now don't just drop three balls and putt to the flag. Because mm. because I call that the Goldilocks syndrome. Too much, too little, just right. Yep. Now you've not learned anything, you've just used two balls to as a sighter sure. and then you get the third one right and you don't really know what you've changed. Yeah. But what happens now is every putt is a feedback loop mm. and when it comes to just green reading, if it curved what you thought it should and doesn't go in, is it speed or start line? Yeah. And, and now they can hit every putt and 
you know, I have a one ball rule. We just play one ball to different locations constantly. Yeah. Because if you hit the same putt twice, you're more than likely going to open or shut the face to make the next one. Yeah. As opposed to adjust your read. Yeah, from there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You know, I never see people practicing changing the read and then saying, right, I mean, what do they do next time? <laughs> what they changed? Mm. You know, aim points um, in units of percentage. Yeah. One, two, three, four. Now, if you ask someone who doesn't use aim point where they aim, they say, you know, that spot there. Yeah. Now, if it's a, let's say it's a 15 inch gap, is, is that five lots of three? Mm. Mm. Or is that one unit? You know, yeah. what's the change? Yeah. How would you reduce that or increase it if your ball misses? Mm. And, I, and I think most players are introspective, right? I will do green, uh, group green reading mm. uh, classes. And what happens is they all seem to get the herd mentality when I ask them to put a tee where they think yeah, that yeah. They, they need to start the ball. Yeah. And the first guy comes out here and they say, we've got this putt and they'll place a tee here. Yeah. And then that sets the tone for the whole group. Exactly. You might get a couple of outrageous personalities that would just randomly put one on the low side yeah. and then a couple out there. But most of them would be around this collection. Yeah, yeah. And I suppose with most things, it's like give someone a chance to pick a number between one and 10, they're going to choose seven. Yeah. So when they're in this, it's okay to feel like you're doing something wildly different, just like it is in swing changes when yeah. you do aim point for the first time. Absolutely. I mean, th you know, in, in two hours, we could make someone world class at green reading. Mm. So aim point is a start, a middle, and an end. When they learn aim point, you come with no understanding. We introduce them to the concepts, and then we practice it, and then mm. we exercise it. We'll move all around the green. We'll do short putts, middle putts, long putts, double breaks, and how to cope with any stimp. Yeah. But in two hours, they can go straight on the golf course and use it. Yeah. And be quick with it. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think we're in the dark ages of green reading still, where most people come with absolutely no concept. Yeah. You know, I, I don't think I've ever coached anyone that says this is good, but what I was doing before was better. Yeah. Ever. Yeah. And uh, they just, in fact, you'll never get feedback like you get from an aim point class. Yeah. You know, they leave excited, they leave accomplished. Mm. Uh, and as far as coaching anything in the golf industry, that's kind of addictive because as you know when you teach someone a swing change it's it's weeks and weeks of repetition before yeah. they see benefits potentially yeah I, th I feel like you get a tangible outcome from yeah. aim point because you've got little wins along the way yeah well, that was the correct read because we can measure exactly. it with the uh yeah. the uh what's that thing the level spirit level. level the level so because we can measure it with the yeah. level and then you go through that process like okay i know i've gone through my maintenance drills mm -hmm. with with my green reading and now i've got a better chance or i'm giving myself the best chance of yep. putting well when i get out there sure yeah yeah cool. and, and now let's suppose in your green reads are perfect mm but you always hit the ball too short, too long. Yeah. That brings you into speed control. Yeah. How do you practice speed control? How do people determine how far the ball goes? Mm. Uh, most people, well, pretty much anyone watching this, I challenge anyone to come back with a good speed or distance control drill yeah. because they can't. Even the tour players I work with just say they've got touch they got or touch. feel. Yeah. But very few of them are exercising their speed yeah. properly. Um, and then if your speed's good and your reads are good and you're missing, it's a start line issue. Mm. Uh, but you. But the others have to indicate the outlier. Mm. You know what I mean? You've, if your start line's amazing and your speed's amazing and you're not making putts, it has to be your green read. Mm. So the most important of those three skills of mm. the trifecta to you is? I'd say green reading okay. because the other two are affected so heavily. Yeah, massively. For example, if you underread a putt, you've either got to start it higher by face manipulation, so you've affected start line already, intentional, or you've got to hit the putt so hard it's it probably going to go over the top of the hole. Mm. Um, so green reading for me would be the, 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 the baseline of everything. Yeah. Not just because obviously my involvement with aim point, but because it affects the others so greatly. Yeah. Um, nobody has start line issues that are so consistent that they can actually misread to one side and make putts. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah so, so that doesn't happen. And speed, speed. You know, we work to a foot pass because that's where the players really want to be. Yeah. Uh, no one wants a, a three foot putt coming back mm. for your second putt. Um, and would you say that the foot past is just to allow for imperfections of the green and a yeah. bit of variance uh, with your read? Yeah, you've got to be six, six inches past the cup because in the last six inches the ball oscillates or wobbles. Mm -hmm. When you get to a foot beyond the cup, the entrance to the hole shrinks. Yeah. So more lip out than lip in. Yeah. So we found that a foot past, anything more than a foot past, you're starting to have a smaller target to go for. Correct. Anything less than six inches, you just aren't going to play greens good enough to hold their line. Yeah. And if you do play amazing greens that are blemish-free, um, if you're not in one of the first few groups, 
then a lot of people have walked over it and it now becomes an issue. Yeah. So and grass grows throughout the day and all of a sudden yeah. the blade's pointing in the wrong direction and takes a little bobble. Totally. I mean, you know, tour events, you, you, you could have 200 pairs of feet yeah. walk, walk around the hole by the time you get there. 